Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you for being here this afternoon. Uh, my name is Bart Osterfeld. Uh, I'm the Director of Global Business and Economics and the Boyd and Gray Fellow here at the Atlantic Council. Uh, we have the distinct honor today of hosting His Excellency Alexander Daniliuk, the Finance Minister of the Ukraine. Minister Daniliuk assumed office almost exactly two years ago on the 14th of April, 2016, um, after a distinguished career in the private sector interspersed with several advisory positions uh, during key economic times for Ukraine. He worked for McKinsey, both London and Moscow, earlier in his career, and has held a variety of senior-level government positions in recent years, including Deputy Head of Presidential Administration in Ukraine. Minister Daniliuk has long advocated the importance of rule of law-based economic reforms in Ukraine, and as, and as Minister of Finance, prioritizes Ukraine's investment climate, ease of doing business, and reform of the government's finances. Minister Daniliuk also oversees the execution of Ukraine's program with the International Monetary Fund. Ukraine's economy is expected to grow around 3% this year, over 3%, rebounding from a sharp downturn and supported by a $17.5 million uh, billion dollar credit line of the fund. The Atlantic Council's Eurasia and Global Business and Economic Centers are very pleased to host this critical and timely discussion. After opening remarks from the minister, uh, we look forward to engaging with you, the audience, and to your questions and remarks. Uh, you can follow today's discussion live th uh, through a live stream and on Twitter at uh, AC Eurasia and ACGBE. On Twitter, please use the ha hashtag Future Ukraine. Thank you, Minister. Good afternoon. It's always a pleasure to, to be here. Um, and it just happened so that uh, I always talk about reforms. Uh, why I'm talking about reforms? Because reforms are important for the country. It's, it changed the country. And today I would like to also talk about the reforms, but in the context of the, um, the pre-election year. Uh, but before I do that, I would like us to uh, to look uh, back uh, for years and just see actually what was achieved. We tend to always look in the future, but it's very important not to forget uh, what was achieved so far. And if you look at the situation uh, in 2014, um, that was actually a very gloomy uh, picture when Ukraine, not only due to aggression, both economic and military, but also for other reasons uh, of the country being unreformed for so many years. Um, we lost 60% um, uh, of GDP. Uh, inflation hit 24, well, actually almost 25%, picking 23% uh, in 2015. Budget deficit increased to 5%. National uh, bank currency and gold reserves decreased to almost uh, um, 5.5 million billion uh, dollars. For Ukraine, it's uh, it's a critically low um, level. Currency rapidly depreciated, and obviously uh, we had a big turmoil on the on the uh, on the trade. Um, by pretty much all of the trade was uh, was Russia being our main par partner, trading partner at that time, uh, being um, uh, uh, being lost. So where are we now? After, after macroeconomic recovery and fiscal consolidation, we're growing three percent, three percent a year, third consecutive year. Uh, obviously, we would like to grow with higher rate, but just showing that we return to growth is also a very positive message. Um, inflation uh, decreased to 9%. Um, budget deficit fallen to 2.7% last year, but actually factual. Factual was 1.7%. Um, and we plan to decrease it um, this year to 2.4%. International currency reserves increase to almost 19 uh, billion, um, and as a result of this uh, stabilization, it allowed us to return to the capital markets, um, 
uh, last year in September um, with uh, an interesting uh, a deal that actually was recognized the best in the region. So we stabilized the business, uh, we stabilized the system under very harsh conditions. Uh, but it's only a starting point. Um, what we need now is, after stabilization, is to unlock the potential of the country. And uh, as one friend, uh, a close friend of mine mentioned, is Ukraine is a country of ever-growing potential. And in my speeches, I you always use it, because we all understand the potential of the country. Uh, but instead of growing this potential, we need to realize it. So actually what we're doing now, the reform agenda uh, pursued by this government is actually unlocking this potential. And a lot of it needs to be done, still needs to be done in the future. We have a very realistic um, picture. Um, and clearly understand what are the challenges that we face at this uh, point of time. Volatility and uncertainty are the main one at this stage. We have started many important reforms. These reforms uh, could have been implemented for the previous 23 years prior to revolutionary dignity. This is a tremendous achievement. For the last four years, we have achieved more than for 23 years since the um, independence till revolution of dignity. It's a fact that's recognized by, uh, by many. But having started reforms, majority of them are not completed. And this is the most vulnerable situation that the country can find itself. Um, when reforms started, people felt the negative impact of reforms. Some of them are painful. Uh, but until they fully completed, people, people cannot realize the benefits. They cannot feel it tangib tangibly. This is a vulnerable situation, especially in pre-election year, especially when the populist movement is growing across the globe. And Ukraine is not the exception. Um, so what are the challenges? Again, this is a pre-election year. Usually attention goes to the political discussions, not to reforms. Um, then population fatigue. For four years, people have been tolerating the, the reforms, right? They be tired. That's normal. It's basically in every country who goes through the um, broad reform um, agenda. Vested interest, where well, Ukraine was never short of vested interest, and especially now they're especially active. Why? It's because um, some of them lost um, the economic interest due to the reforms, and they're fighting for their interest in whatever has remained. And they're fighting very fiercely. Um, that's a factor. Institutional weakness. Mainly, it's, uh, it's a legacy of, of the past. Institutions are weak because we never had a focus on building strong institutions. There was never actually belief in strong institutions. But we understand that, especially if we're talking about and implementing a broad agenda, we need to have, it's done by people. It's done by institutions who, um, who work in disciplined manner day after day, every day, they work on implementing sometimes extremely difficult uh, reforms. Specifically, if we talk about unreformed institutions, uh, it's worth to mention General Prosecutor Office, uh, our Secret Service, SBU, those the institutions that actually um, remain relatively unchanged since the um, Soviet times. They don't know what market is, they don't know what their role in the modern 21st century Ukraine is, that the business is not the enemy, is actually who build the business, build the economy, they create jobs, they pay taxes, and by the way, these taxes are paid in the budget, and from this budget, SBU and General Prosecutor is financed. 
very simple principle, but somehow it doesn't get to their uh, mind. So they continue some interference uh, with the business, but uh, the government policy is to restrict it to as much possible, to the much possible extent. State fiscal service also uh, relatively unreformed uh, institution with a lot of vested interest built in, uh, and that only could be addressed uh, through the deep and comprehensive reform, right, which involved the changing of majority of people in this institution. Just changing the way they work, putting new procedures, will not bring results. People need to change as well. Judicial system, similar situation, uh, but you cannot say that it's unreformed because it's undergoing now the major reform um, uh, uh, program, the whole judiciary uh, system. And another factor, which it's, it's fact, is deteriorating demography. We have a very low um, birth rate in the country, actually historically low, we registered last year. And uh, immigration becoming uh, uh, you know, more, more of a problem. So what, that are the t challenges. Some of them could be addressed short term. Some of them cannot. Uh, these challenges make our path more difficult, but doesn't change the trajectory. We know where we're going. Um, we have a very clear plan. And we were going to implement this plan. The, what is in our plan? First is the talking about structural reforms is a, Land market reform, energy sector reform, and healthcare reform. The healthcare reform we initiated a, an implementation a month ago, and it will take at least two years to fully implement. And that needs to be done in, in a very careful way because this is one of the most important reforms for the country. We cannot get it wrong. Uh, energy sector reform, we've been already working it for pretty much for the last four years. Um, it lo a lot still has to be done, but within pretty much a year we should complete it. Land market, mar land market reform, we actually plan to start it this year, but uh, again, the political interference during the pre-election period makes it more difficult, but I'm still quite positive uh, on it. Uh, privatization. We, um, just a month ago, we changed the legislation, uh, simplifying the privatization processes that allows us to, um, to sell state-owned companies that are now mismanaged, um, sell it uh, in a transparent uh, privatization process. Um, and we separated the, it in two parts. First is selling big companies through the advisors and small companies or electronic auctions. So we, we understand that institutional weakness also applies to the capacity, ability to sell companies. So we, as, we try to change the process in such a way that this process would depend less on the people um, in the government, but more from either the professional advisors or actually a process, electronic process, where there is little interference from the, uh, from the, uh, from the state. And obviously, in the plan is uh, anti-corruption efforts. Ukraine has done a lot. Um, there is a quite serious pushback. Again, why? It's because we're progressing. It's good when there is a pushback. If there is no pushback, it means that uh, nothing is happening. So we've been, you know, after setting up uh, National Agency for uh, sorry, uh, uh, NABU, uh, uh, Bureau, Anti-Corruption Bureau, an agency for prevention corruption. corruption. The next stage is to set up anti-corruption court, and the work is uh, underway now. The respective law is, uh, is voted in first reading, and everybody watching in inside the country, uh, but outside as well, and uh, when and in what shape the final law would be adopted, because everybody understands Anti-corruption court is crucial for completing the anti-corruption infrastructure and delivering on the anti-corruption um, efforts. 
finalization of judicial reform, SFS, creating financial police. When I mentioned about the prosecutor general and secret service, you know, I did it on purpose because we not just understand the problem, we also understand we have a solution. So we're working now on creating the financial police that will take power from the secret service, take powers from the general prosecutor, tax police and national police from the economic di 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 divisions, and they put it in one small institution that would be um, professional, fair, and is built on the model which has been used for, uh, for creating NABU from scratch, bringing new people with training, uh, with support of our international partner, first of all, United States of America. Um, also in the plan uh, to, and this is clearly in the, in the Minister of Finance uh, responsibility, is implement anti-money laundering uh, legislation and implementation of the BEPS uh, minimum standard. So that's our plan. We understand the challenges. Um, we also see that the previous performance showed that we can do difficult reforms. And despite new difficulties, we will be able to achieve what we set as a target in front of us. But we also need to understand that we're still fighting two wars. The one war was with our neighbor, another war with internal forces who are trying to push back, to push back on reforms. And Ukraine is not homogeneous. You know, we just cannot expect the country to change so quickly. Uh, so this war is inside the country is also uh, taking place and it's quite active. But again, looking back, what we achieved over the four years, it's clear that the new system, new people are winning. And we are demonstrating a very strong uh, uh, progress. And I'm sure that we will be much stronger despite even the difficulties of the uh, pre-election and election years. But what we also need, and it is a difficult time, to have a continued support of our international partners that, were, that have been so helpful over the last four years and not only. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for that for that overview and, and um, most comprehensive uh, view of where where you are, what some of the accomplishments are, and what some of the remaining challenges are in, in your view. And before uh, opening up to the audience, I wanted to talk with you about three broad topics. Um, first, uh, complete and round out the discussion about the reform agenda, and then I would like that to relate that to the IMF program and. Uh, the discussions you're probably currently having in Washington as you're here this week for the spring meetings. Uh, the second is I wanted to delve in a little bit more deeply on the anti-corruption agenda uh, that uh, that you have and uh, perhaps uh, focus also on what a more supportive uh, Western attitude towards uh, that agenda might look like and uh, what assistance uh, you would welcome from uh, either multinational institutions or uh, other countries. Um, and then finally, uh, and this is a topic you, you didn't touch on extensively, I'd like to get your views on uh, what good growth, economic growth for the Ukraine would look like, and, uh, where you would like it to be. Um, I, I know that 3% given where you were a few years ago is, is a big accomplishment and the result of many efforts and reforms, uh, but I suspect you would like it to be higher and I'd like uh, to engage in a discussion with you as to what the conditions would be uh, that that would engender high, higher growth and, and what your views are on that. So, uh, starting with uh, with the reforms, you, I think you used the term incomplete reforms. Um, uh, you mentioned healthcare, which is on track and and uh, meant to be you know on on its way to success. Uh, you mentioned tax reform, VAT. Um, the IMF has put out there certain thoughts on reforms. It would still like to see completed before uh, going on uh, with the programs. Um, just uh, picking out two. Uh, first, the pension system. Yep. And then the second, uh, 
uh, gas prices, which is a topic of frequent conversation. If you would, wouldn't mind, they're disjointed, but if you wouldn't mind commenting on both. Sure, thank you. Uh, on the uh, reform agenda in the context of uh, IMF, um, uh, IMF cooperation, uh, we have uh, at the moment two uh, prior actions which are not uh, completed. Uh, first is the passing the law on creation of anti-corruption court. Mm -hmm. And uh, second is the uh, automatic adjustment, introducing the mechanism for automatic adjustment of the gas tariffs um, to, uh, to market level. So pension reform we did uh, implement it uh, in uh, early autumn, actually mid-autumn last year. So that, um, that, is, uh, that was a very important reform uh, that was done jointly with, with the World Bank, with IMF. Uh, and uh, I remember that was, uh, was difficult to find solution, but actually everybody was excited because for so many years we were sh uh, shying away from the problem. And the first time we actually put together you know, thoughts and, um, and uh, decisiveness and actually done it. So I'm actually quite uh, happy with, um, uh, uh, with the results. Um, talking about anti-corruption court, um, again, the law um, was, the draft law is already passed in the first reading. So pretty much, uh, this is number one requirement for IMF, mm -hmm. right, uh, in IMF program. But I can tell you this is a number one uh, demand from people in Ukraine because they've seen anti-corruption infrastructure being put in place. They've seen some investigation being started. They've seen some cases being sent to the courts. But courts sit on these cases. Um, they're just not willing to make decisions, to take the risk sometimes. Um, so clearly, for everything there is explanation, but people don't want to listen to explanations. If they see that there is some corruption in the country, then maybe there should be some punishment for that. Just logical. At the moment, uh, it's not the case. I can tell you, in, in, you know, I, I always take quite active position as well. And I have um, uh, specific examples with, uh, with my work when I had um, the head of the state, uh, state fiscal service uh, removed more than a year ago, who was known for being um, engaged in some um, corruption activities, right? So I had a very, you know, I had a public conflict with him. So guess what? You know, eventually case is currently in the court, but it's a regular court. So approximately the, the whole process will run for at least two years. So it's not how you fight with corruption. So that's why anti-corruption court is important, is essential. Uh, so the next step is passing it in the final reading, uh, the law. And uh, for that, the all amendments which are now being introduced to this law needs to be carefully, uh, carefully examined. And only those who uh, improve the quality of the law and uh, corresponds to our international requirements and to our constitution needs to be adopted, right? The harmful amendments needs to be removed. That's it. We've done it before. It's not a rocket science. That's a typical standard work. For example, on the pension reform, if I'm not mistaken, we had more than 4,000 amendments. Don't, don't, don't laugh. In Ukraine, every serious law needs to have at least 2,000 amendments. Otherwise, it's not a serious law. Um, so it's anti-corruption court is relatively serious law. That's why I have enough amendments, you know, um, to work on it. So, but I'm quite uh, I'm quite optimistic on this um, on passing uh, of this law, and not just optimistic overall, but I also believe it will be done, um, you know, end of April, maybe May, right? Because pretty much we have already this Lego, you know, the. Uh, the law with amendments now just needs to be put in place and put to vote. Will it be easy? No. But it will be done because of internal pressure in 
because of the principal position also within the government, uh, but also externally. It's important, it's all now international obligations as well, so it's going to happen. Um, on the gas, um, on the gas, the, the state for requirement is introduced this automatic adjustment of the price mechanism, mm -hmm. but we always, you know, it's very important actually to look broader than that. Uh, IMF is not about just gas prices. And overall, it's about the, you know, developing the economy, stabilizing the financial system. So what we need for that, we need to have a competitive gas market. Competitive, why? Because, you know, we can have players, they compete, they also, you know, they, you know that, that will bring prices down. It's, it's a market. You don't need to regulate it at the end of the day. It's not the role of the government to set the tariffs. Right? It should be our aim is to build the open market um, in Ukraine so that the role of the government will be minimum. So that's what we're also discussing currently with IMF, but not only discussing, we're implementing it. For example, we, since 1st of January, we introduced the subsidies monetization. Um, why is it important? Because it allows not only to sustain monopoly of Naknafta gas, to supply gas to the almost 60% of the population, but any company can do it. Prior to that, it, was, it wasn't possible. Now, with monetization, it's money, right? It's a very simple mechanism which allows to other companies, private companies, to come and compete. And many other examples that we um, initiated, that we introduced to create the market. Um, so I'm quite positive on the, on the IMF. Um, Timing, I usually don't like to give uh, timing. This is a very, it's immediately gets into the news. There is nothing new here. Mm. Everybody understand that the prior conditions need to be met before we receive a tranche. And this tranche itself is, uh, as many other tranches, is, um, it's, uh, it's a symbolic for us. Especially for the government, we do not receive the, 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 the money from uh, IMF. They don't go to finance the budget needs. Mm -hmm. They replenish the, uh, the national bank reserves, strengthen our currency. But um, we rely on our budget deficit, uh, discipline. We rely also on the, you know, on the, uh, on the internal, external uh, borrowing to finance the, the budget deficit needs, not IMF. Mm -hmm. For that, obviously, um, you know, is the optimum conditions when we progress with IMF then those operations become cheaper and more available. Okay, thank you. And uh, so you, you asked about the economic growth. Well, I don't believe you said, you know, 3% are not satisfied. I can tell you I'm not satisfied with 3.5%. We more kind of agree to the 6 to 8%, right, level. So um, what needs to be done for that? Well, actually, there are a lot of discussions in Ukraine. Um, intellectual discussions. Um, sometimes I engage in these discussions, sometimes I, sometimes I disengage because I don't like when people telling me about a unique Ukrainian path, and especially when it's said by people who don't understand how economy work. Um, so, but overall, when I mention what we know where we're going, right? There are a very, there needs to be First of all, we need to resolve the, the problems, the elephants in the rooms, right? They are, you know, they're obvious, here they are. So, yeah, here's the elephant, so we need to do something with it. So for example, land market reform. Of course we can say that Ukraine is not an agricultural country, we need to think about new technologies. Excuse me, agriculture is a big part of our economy and it has a huge potential. So if you're serious about promoting the economic growth, we need to introduce land market in the country. That's it. Of course, we need to look for new opportunities for you know, in IT sector, you know. But you know that needs to be done first. Privatization. It's also why should we look for something else if in front of us there is a problem? A lot of state-owned companies being mismanaged. They need to be privatized. Private money needs to come in, and. Um, and uh, improve the effectiveness of this, uh, of this company and competitiveness. Um, so 
that's, that's how I see it. And in other, uh, during my speech, I mentioned the creation of financial police. It has two purposes. First is finally, Ukraine needs to have an institution that would be able to effectively investigate economic crimes against the state. At the moment, we do not have any institutions that could do it, which have enough trust from public and enough proof that they've been successful in the past. Yeah, we have a lot of competition about you know, how great we all fight with crimes, but where are the results? So we need to have one institution like this. But why I'm mentioning this in the section of economic growth in your question is because the another side of creating financial police is taking the powers from these old uh, institutions that oppress the business. So this is, should not be underestimated the importance of this. Because it's actually a bit frustrating when you, you take the risk, you do many uh, difficult reforms, uh, invest your time, and then because we didn't remove the elephant from the room, we ha you don't see results as you want. And says, in other elephant, we have several in the rooms, right? Uh, but this one is like very close to you. SBU, Prosecutor General Office, Tax Police, and, and National Police. They, have, they should not touch the business. It's not their role. Do you think everybody understands this in the country? The answer is yes, everybody understands. So on this level of obstruction, there is a consensus. But when we try to do something, there is enormous resistance. Because that's where actually historically vested interests are built in. Mm -hmm. Because those institutions for so many years, since uh, Soviet Union, they've been everywhere. They was part of the culture, they were part of the system. The everywhere was, you know, SBU guys, HKGB at that time. You know, they, they were for different purposes. But then they very quickly they adapted the new situation after the independence. They found how to use their influence, their, you know, their position to make money for themselves and be the instrument for, uh, uh, for, for manipulation and, and oppression. So they need to be changed, as it was done in, uh, in other countries, uh, who's done it the first thing after getting the independence. First of all, Baltic states, Poland, right? It's now time for us to do it. Thank you. Uh, I want to pick up on a, on a few topics you mentioned. Uh, first, you, you focused a lot on ease of doing, doing business and, and the investment climate overall in, in Ukraine. Um, investment to GDP has dropped uh, quite significantly over the past uh, year or two. Uh, what do you attribute that to? And, and uh, we can talk again about elephants in the room, but the, you've, you've now mentioned those. Are there key reforms uh, that, that in, in your view, remain outstanding or that affect the growth picture? Well, there is one reason which cannot be ignored is the, is the war and the impact it has on the, uh, on the investor, investor perception. That's, uh, that's an obvious uh, uh, f f uh, fact. In 2014-15 was the active phase uh, of the war and you, when you look the, watch the news, you, you see the war. Yes, it only affects the small territory of Ukraine. Ukraine is a huge country. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, for example, you know, if you take the distance from the, uh, you know, from Donetsk to Lvov, for example, Uzhgorod, it's maybe the same as from, you know, London to, to Palermo. Yeah, it's big distance, right? It's a huge country. But yet, when you switch on the news or investors look, invest, Ukraine, war. Of course, it's, uh, it doesn't help the, uh, the foreign uh, uh, you know, investments. Um, but this is just one of the factors. Um, also, investors wanted to see the clear, um, you know, the clear reform agenda, the results. They want to see what will be the government regulation so they know what they're buying, they know where they're investing to. And I think it's more or less uh, clear now. Obviously, the obstacle now is election. Again, some investors may decide to wait a little bit. But uh, from our point of view, we do everything possible you know, to, uh, to promote um, 
privatization in the country, but also to attract investments uh, uh, in the country. And the result will be, uh, will come for sure. Uh, I already see the, because I speak a lot with investors, I see this appetite. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, it's, it's clearly there. So the, the, money, the money will come. And in our policies, we do everything to, to make it easier. Uh, for example, uh, in the law that I mentioned, uh, where we changed the processes for privatization, we deliberately included one clause um, that uh, addresses the, uh, the concerns that you know, the judiciary system is not fully reformed yet, um, and the regulation is changing in Ukraine. So what we put in place as a clause is that if investors would like to privatize company, they have a right if they decide to, they can, they can sign the privatization agreement, which will be regulated by English and Wales law, known to pretty much everybody in, mm -hmm. you know, in the world. So actually, we're even proposing such uh, unusual um, terms, because we understand that that actually could remove some of the risks. So why shouldn't we propose this? Okay. Thank you. Uh, one final question, and then I'll uh, ask the audience for, for their comments and questions. Um, you talked a lot about vested interests, and now we've talked uh, quite a bit about anti-corruption measures and, and, and your plans and reforms there. What would a supportive environment look like for you as a country? What can other countries do to support that effort? What can institutions like the IMF or the World Bank do to support that effort? Well, I believe that um, if we're talking about um, the cooperation with IMF, with World Bank, you know, what is effective is when it's one or two reforms, but there is a focus. Um, so in this particular case, creation of anti-corruption court is the focus, not only for IMF, it's also focus for the World Bank, mm -hmm. it's for US, EU. So this is, this is like unilateral, uh, you know, uh, understanding that this is, this is, this is important. But um, I would also, I'm, I'm the person who, I'm not talking about Ukrainian past or something, but I do believe that at the end of the day, it's up to Ukrainians. It's up to Ukrainians uh, to fight with the vested interest, interest. We have very strong civil society, right? We have a lot of uh, reformers in the, in the country. We have a demanding population. Uh, not many countries went uh, through the, um, you know, in the modern history, the period when millions of people were on the streets and demanding their right to, to impact the, you know, have a right to impact the policy, uh, you know, the, the weather will be with, uh, you know, Russia, EU, they demand active participation. Um, so, and they do not tolerate corruption. European Maidan, yes, or Euromaidan, right? It was about, you know, under European flags. But my view, it was um, a revolution against corruption. That's, that's how I read it. And people do not, are not going to tolerate it. Yes, vested interests are there. There are much less of it. I'm pretty much every day fighting with those. As a minister of finance, you understand when there is a financial resources, there is always interest. Some of it are vested interest. <laughs> so uh, it's difficult. Um, but again, you mentioned, um, for, for example, if I mentioned the uh, VAT um, refund area, a year ago, slightly more than a year ago, we introduced a new system how to um, uh, refund VAT in a transparent way, because it used to be the most corrupt um, kind of area in the country where businesses had to pay billions in kickbacks, right, for, uh, for refund of their own money. So we've done it. It was a lot of resistance. People who now are saying that, you know, great, wonderful, you know, they've been trying to stop it. But they couldn't. Because when you have strong people who, you know, committed to do things, it's also not that easy to stop it. The institutional weakness also works other way around as well. So um, 
you have strong reformers, you see results, mm -hmm. right? And weakness works against uh, against those who wants to uh, to stop it. So that's why I would say for the IMF, World Bank is focused approach, but um, you know, changing the country is up to Ukrainians, and the that's why this political cycle. Um, which is a new political cycle that starts, it's also important because people will judge. We expected the fight with corruption. Where do we see results? Who supported this war? It's corruption, right? So we will support those people. You know, who promised, you know, the, um, you know, better quality health care? Who promised they will judge on the promises and how they actually these promises were, um, whether they will deliver it upon or not. So that's how it is in theory, and that's how it be in practice. I'm sure. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Minister. I'd like to open it to the to the audience for your questions. Yes, ma'am. Hello, uh, my name is Eleanor Bakrak. I worked for USAID in Ukraine from 95 to 2000. Uh, very exciting time, but learned the lesson that you said that these things all take time. Now, fighting, I'd like to ask a bit about the anti-corruption court, because normally I'm skeptical of uh, curing problems with institutions, but Obviously, the regular court system hasn't reformed, and if I were a Ukrainian, and if the new institution worked properly, I'd try to make sure that any case I had could be defined as anti-corruption. Um, do you see this all potentially as a catalyst for reforming or replacing the whole court system over time? The logic that we have, thank you for the, for the question. I'm <laughs> jumping into answering. The logic is the following, is the judiciary reform, uh, it's a lengthy and a very complex process. It was started two years ago. It will go for some time, right? Um, and we already have some, some good results. For example, if you look at the, at the Supreme Court, um, the, the chairwoman of the Supreme Court, uh, actually I wasn't following this process. I was also a bit skeptical. So when I see the results, I see who actually chaired it, I know, I know her because we worked with her in 2005. Uh, I think she was a contractor to USA, USA by the way, at that time, <laughs> right? On, the, on some important pieces of legislation so she's clearly a very, you know, she's, she has a very high reputation uh, among the civil society, among the people. Uh, you know, I respect her a lot because we've done so many things uh, together. So actually, just this is one example that, uh, example that reform is successful, but it takes time. So what is the answer? Is having the anti-corruption court. Why? Because if you use a typical uh, standard uh, judiciary system, you know you, you go and your case, anti-corruption case, has the same because it come in the in the queue and has the same uh, priority as I don't know, you know, uh, stealing a you know a cat, right? <laughs> Which is wrong. <laughs> um, so that's why the the, the anti-corruption court will focus only on corruption cases uh, open against the high officials. So it's a, it's a pretty much, um, it's a replica uh, of the National Anti-Corruption Bureau. National Anti-Corruption Bureau focus on the high level corruption. Mm -hmm. And when they, you know, submit, you know, investigate, submit the case to the court, that needs to be um, considered by the anti-corruption court. And it only be focusing on these high level cases. And the expectation will be uh, that uh, you know, there will be attention given to these cases and everybody will be watching results. Because at the moment, there's a big system. Where is this case? Where is this case? You know, one is in one uh, district of Kiev court. Another one, you understand it's a mess. 
But here, maybe it's unusual uh, for, uh, for the world. But I think for Ukraine it's important, right? Everybody will be watching. If there is, for example, the case against one of the MPs, right? And it's in, in the court. The trust to this court, that was matters, right? People will be watching. It will be like a magnifying glass. And if there is a trust to this court, then there will be results. So that's the logic. I'm not, uh, I understand that you might be skeptical. Um, it's my third time in the government. Things are not always were that, uh, you know, um, wonderful, right? I cannot say it's wonderful now, but clearly what been achieved is, um, is, is quite dramatic, actually. Thank you, ma'am. Elaine Sreo, Associate Rector for, w, uh, for UACU, WIUU in Kiev, Ukraine. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I particularly focused on the numbers that you were able to present, and then also how there seems to be a lack of the, maybe the message of those, of the impact of the progress getting out to the public especially even in an election year, what is being done throughout the Oblasts to make sure that uh, your message, as you've been presenting it, uh, about the progress of the reforms and how it's impacting on communities, what kind of positive information can you give other than numbers? You know, like, this has happened, that's happened in the particular Oblasts. Can you uh, tell about anything about what is sure. going on for public sure. diplomacy? Uh, it's, uh, thank you for the question. It's uh, actually an interesting question because uh, immediately puts me in a position, okay, so you know, what should we do? Well, when I think about this, first of all, you can tell people the numbers, but you can tell numbers in America. People judge by you know, whether they feel the difference. You know, I can tell you so many numbers, but if you don't feel it, you will get bored, and then you will get annoyed. Um, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't communicate, but this is just one fundamental <laughs> um, message. Second, specifically you mentioned uh, decentralization. So, in fact, one of the most important reforms that is almost completed is decentralization. We gave a lot of money, resources, and powers to the region. And, and that's it. Why we've done it? Because they know better how to use this money, they're closer to the people. And second, we as a central government now can focus on what really were created for, for the, you know, the, the, the policy making that affects the whole country. Um, so who is going to promote and say about these numbers? I believe it's now not our responsibility. If those who use this money in the regions, they, it's there now, it's now. It's, this money there is theirs, right? So this is their responsibility, how are they are going to use it? And what we see now is even people, they compare, you know, why, what, you know, we've seen what's happening in Vinitsa or we've seen what's happening in Ivano-Frankovsk. Why it's not happening in our town? That actually is much more important than us as a central government trying to say that, look what we achieved. Why? Because it's not our achievement for the last three years. It's achievement already in local governments. Um, so, but clearly the decentralization is an is achievement and, you know, it needs to be communicated. It's, you know, I, I take it, but not specifically by uh, regions, but overall, we gave you these uh, powers, we gave you the resources. Now people who are close to you, who you select, defines how you're going to live. So this is us, we've done it. 
first government in the history we've done it. And we will communicate this. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Oris Tichkiewski, U.S. Ukraine Foundation. Um, you had mentioned in your remarks, uh, you seem to express some optimism with respect to land market reform following the elections. I wonder if you could elaborate on that, on the basis of your optimism. <laughs> what, what's changed? Because it hasn't been going anywhere too quickly in recent years. <laughs> well, first of all, um, it's not a slavery, right? So I'm not doomed to do this job. Uh, so if I'm not optimistic, I wouldn't do it, right? Uh, so slavery in Ukraine was abolished many years ago. Uh, so I'm optimistic because I'm actually also working on it. And I see what could be done. We've been very close to launching this reform uh, in uh, summer last year. And unfortunately, some, um, some events, unfortunate, right? You know, just we, we, we lost the momentum. I, you know, I feel bad about this. Uh, usually, in order to restart it, it takes some time. And now we, again, pretty much ready. But this, the only complexity is the election, right? And usually I'm trying to, I'm not that experienced uh, politician, I'm trying to, at least when I set the target, to ignore the election. <laughs> but elections are elections. And we, um, that will incl include a very extensive dialogue in the country. And communication should be, again, we cannot miss it. Um, so my optimism is, A, we're ready. We know what we're going to be launching. We just need to though, run a communication campaign and see whether it resonates. We need to explain people why it is done. The question is time. Uh, so there is still chance, maybe not, uh, why not uh, this year? Because what is really interesting is that for some reason, people, people believe is there is a consensus, actually, almost consensus in the, in the political elites that land reform is bad. Why? Why is it bad? Why is it bad to give people their rights to use their property? Why is it bad? Why is it bad to create conditions for economic growth? Why? I think that's why communication campaign is necessary. That's why the personal leadership for this re uh, reform is necessary to do it. Because I even have a feeling that we can get millions of people who would come to Kyiv and demand this reform. But nobody thought about this. Uh, because do not, uh, you know, do not underestimate this. Uh, um, uh, the people, they, they know what is important and what is not. So that's why I'm optimistic. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Agnia Grigas, Atlantic Council. Um, Minister, I wanted to uh, come back to the question of elections and the public. Uh, the public does tend to vote with their pocketbooks. And as you have started out in your comments, you know, the, the start of reforms tend to be, you know, well, painful and then fatigue sets in. So are there any signals, um, it, you say today, or maybe in the coming year you think that are coming, that would be positive for the Ukrainian public's pocketbooks? Well, first of all, uh, population fatigue, if you look at the ratings, you see that ratings are low for those who are currently in power. That actually reflects the population fatigue as well. Um, so that's uh, that's unfortunately the, the reality. And Ukraine is not the only one, the country. Um, so obviously uh, there is still some time to fix like, uh, some of this. But 
but in terms of if we look at the election, how people vote, that's why I said this is the most vulnerable time because uh, some populists, uh, for them it's a wonderful time now. They can fill the pockets of Ukrainians mm. with promises. Um, that's what they usually populists do, do, right? That's a big risk. How are we going to, um, to, uh, to react, to counter-react to this? Um, well, first of all, and this is what my minister is doing, um, and this is our role in the pre-election period, in the whole election, um, we want to keep um, the clear vision for the next three years. What are we planning to do? How much resources we have? Because we've done it two years ago, we first time introduced three-year uh, budgeting forecast, right? And, and we've done it in such a way that we're not talking about general things. Mm -hmm. We said that's how much money we have. You know, that how much we allocate to each of the ministry based on what they're planning to do over the next years. So if healthcare, if the uh, Minister for Healthcare plans to do healthcare reform and we as a government support it, you know, we see how much money is needed and allocate this money. If it means that some other reforms will not receive money, so be it. It's our decision, right? We prioritize it. But we need to be very honest uh, about what we could do, what we cannot do. So we want to, you know, and our plan is to keep this uh, picture, what will be done. And so if, if populists come in with a wonderful idea, for example, you know, of increasing the wages or reducing the taxes, introducing some interesting ideas, for everything, you know, our role will be to calculate the impact and see whether it fits or doesn't. And we will be extremely vocal. Yes, we may be technocrats, but we'll not let the election time and populists to destroy what we achieved so far. Now we're going to fight for that. And so more trans you know, the more transparent we are, the more open we are, you know, the less chances chances populists will have. And we're doing it already. There were a couple of initiatives which we stopped. I'm very vocal about this. I said, no, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen unless you prove me that it's going to work. But nobody can, because people don't like to run numbers. They like to give promises. Um, but I think every promise needs to have a price tag. And this price tag needs to be known to the, uh, to the people of Ukraine how much they will have to sacrifice in order to, uh, uh, to implement some promises. Okay, well, this is a topic in which Ukraine is certainly not alone. The promises of populists, is a, that's a global topic. It's global? These days. So, uh, yes, sir, over there. We're all learning. Mm. Beach Gray, Noveta Corporation. I'm wondering if you can talk about the media environment in Ukraine and what effect it has on the economy. Because looking from the outside, it's very complex. It's a lot of media outlets are owned by oligarchs. There are more um, sort of strong civil uh, society um, media outlets, such as Stop Fake. But is that something that you think is a priority to be reformed? Or is it something that has to develop on its own? and that over time will become sort of more reliable because we know that media affects markets and the economy. Thank you. And affects elections. Um, historically, in Ukraine, media was dominated and is dominated by oligarchs. It's still the case. And given the role of the media in the modern world, um, it's a very powerful uh, instrument. How to address it? 
I maybe do not have the full, um, I don't have the answer, right? But I'm thinking about it myself because I understand that, yeah, you can change the election process. You know, you change the election system. Uh, we, for example, we introduced the uh, new re uh, requirements for transparent party finances, you know. But eventually, if the media is dominated um, by those who might convert it in their own interest or supporting those who support their interest now, you know, this is, this is clearly a disadvantage. So one um, initiative which is being currently implemented is public broadcasting. We're doing everything possible to finance it properly from the budget, but I can tell you that there are attempts to cut financing all the time. Um, but, you know, this is only one of the initiatives. Will it change the balance? No. But it is an important uh, step uh, forward. Um, there is a very radical way how to do it, but I don't think it's the right step, right? Because uh, at the end of the day, um, you, know, you know, the freedom of speech needs to be respected. Whether we have manipulated messages through the TV channels, clearly, and you can see. Even can you, when you speak with people, you see, oh, this person is watching this channel. It's clear why he speaks, right? This person gets information from this channel. And that's how they vote. Um, I don't know how to change it. But if we building, a, you know, a real democracy, that needs to be a democracy. And uh, so the, 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 there should be true information in the channels and should not be biased. Uh, so I just confirm that it's a very important issue, but I also confirm that I don't have the answer. At least in these elections, it will happen under the influence of this, in, uh, of this in media. Maybe in the future, social networks will have a more significant impact, but you know, we, but on the other hand, it's also quite narrow, right? People who tend to use social, uh, social networks, they don't vote. They prefer to go on, uh, you know, to play volleyball or something. Usually youth, you know, don't, not that active. Um, and uh, at least to social networks, there is also this feeling that, you know, everybody is around you, support you. Why? It's because you tend to communicate with the same audience. <laughs> Um, so, at the moment, we don't have a solution, but it will not be unique for Ukraine. I think it, you know, that it should be a new trend in, in overall in the world, uh, because otherwise we will have less and less democracy. Okay. Sir, in the back. Uh, my name is Mike Moore with EWSA. What about energy reform? As you get close to the election, you've got a, a real heavy subsidized system for home heating, for transportation. You're getting ready to cut the anthracite coal uh, imports from Russia. You've got a phenomenal amount of gas resources in the ground with your shale deposits that are well known and recognized. And we're 10 years into plant shale in the United States, so it works pretty good. Any comment on that? Because those are big pieces of your economy right now. It could be. Um, energy, ref energy sector is going through the very dramatic transformation. Uh, there are several segments to it. For example, if you look at the coal, um, our power generation was, to a big extent, dependent on the coal. Well, 85, I believe 80, 85 uh, mines were lost due to the war in the east. So that's the one trigger that changes. Um, that means you know, we need to have a, a, a reaction on this. You know, we have uh, uh, in distribution uh, sector we introduced the RAP regulation in order to make it attractive. In the gas sector, uh, there is overall trend to increase comp competition, so that we will not have the this big 
national oil, uh, gas company, Naknafta Gas, who controls pretty much everything. But actually, we unbundle it by business units, and which would foster, you know, improve competition. Um, in in terms of the gas um, exploration, uh, we've done financially. We made it already attractive. We even reduced the royalty rates uh, for this year. It was a big discussion, and it was an easy decision for the Ministry of Finance. Because it typically, the answer is no. Why? Is because you have, in the first years, you have reductions of revenues. Uh, only then you see some uh, increase in revenues uh, because you know, the stimulus for investments will start to pay uh, back. So we've done these steps. Uh, where there needs to be done more work is, is regulation. Licenses allocation. That's where the real issue is. And here we have some vested interest. So you, you know, changing tax policies when you push it to the parliament is done. When it comes to the licenses, here you have it's already a bureaucratic process. So that's that's where I see the bottleneck at the moment. But you know, seeing the problem, which means that you know we can resolve it. So what we what we do is uh, we we're looking for such for such solutions and um, the what we see already is that domestic production is picking up we made a very bad decision in 2014 by reducing the uh, by increasing the royalties and sent a very bad signal to the market player saying okay you cannot trust the government if they change their mind they say it's important increasing production want to create stimulus and then they increase royalties so in my term in the office, I was very persistent on either stabilizing them or actually reducing. Because I understand that you know, the investors need to get the clarity that the government is supportive to the, uh, to the gas uh, exploration to that will help us to be um, energy independent. Uh, so we're doing things. And, um, and we see more and more interest. We see inter international companies coming, exploring their, uh, their opportunities. So energy sector, you will see big changes there. Thank you. Sir. Uh, George Shapivsky, Atlantic Council. Uh, speaking of energy, um, it's a clearly established uh, and generally accepted legal fact that Crimea is part of Ukraine. Um, many experts also say that in the territorial waters of Crimea, the deep sea territorial waters of Crimea, there are huge hydrocarbon deposits mm -hmm. similar to, to those in the Caspian Sea. These hydrocarbon deposits, therefore, legally are part of Ukraine. My question to you, Mr. Minister, is, is the government doing anything to exploit these hydrocarbon deposits in Ukraine's Crimean territorial waters? And if not, can you maybe, Nabihu, just propose some uh, approaches as to how this asset ought to be managed? Thank you. If 10 minutes, we should be able to solve that one. No problem. <laughs> and I believe... <laughs> everyone in this room to support the position that Crimea is Ukraine. If somebody doesn't, maybe they raise their hand. <laughs> so I accept that we look at the list of invitees, everybody support this, thank you. Uh, now, yeah, there is this issue uh, that by illegal annexation of Crimea, um, um, Russia also got control of our, um, of our reserves. They also, not just reserve, but oil rigs as well. You know, they actually was, uh, it has some very you know, bad I impact on, uh, on, our, on our production and also on the, on, on, the, on the prospects. What we will do, well, clearly, um, you know, when we physically cannot be present where the, the, the reserves are, we're kind of limited, right? Well, I'm not sure because we're talking about 
deep sea, deep deep water territorial, <clears throat> deep water territorial uh, territorial waters, where you know the only um, the only presence of Russia there would be their navy, <laughs> right? But if you were to if you were to sign a production development agreement with uh, I see what you mean. I see, see what you mean. Thank you. Yeah, clearly sitting and waiting this is not the right option. So we will explore these ideas. I see what you mean. Actually it may be a very reasonable way of going forward. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question. <coughs> Yes, sir. Hi, um, Alex, Alex Ishwili from PM Policy and Management Consulting Group. So you mentioned uh, all the reforms, but not uh, public administration reform. And uh, when we are talking about business enabling environment, then of course these licenses and permits and all these very important business entry points are heavily um, kept by bureaucracy, right? So, and then um, having experience working in Georgia as a Minister of Finance, we had exactly the same situation when we abolished licenses or permits and then bureaucrats came back with some new ideas with uh, absolutely different names, but with the same functions as license and permits. So, But you also uh, were a bureaucrat, right, at that time? Uh, sure, right? yeah, of course. But the idea was that then how to reduce this heavy burden of bureaucracy itself to eliminate this uh, bureaucratic burden that was inherited from the past. And that's the way to deal with the public administration reform. And do you have any steps towards that? I understand that for pre-election period, this is not so much um, maybe popular right now. It will be not so much contributing to reforms, but after elections, maybe there will be something else. Thank you. First of, th first of all, I think that uh, uh, such reforms are always popular. Um, so we, kind of, we could be populist and do the right thing. Um, it's not only about administrative uh, 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 reform. When you say it's about bureaucracy, uh, and that's what you've done in Georgia as well, is uh, by simplifying the processes. Um, then uh, you can achieve a lot. Um, again, I refer to the same case with uh, VAT refund that we introduced. It was, uh, it was a nice idea. We just redesigned process entirely. We see where the risks are, where actually people can intervene and get their interest, right? And we just redesigned the process in such a way, and by the way, fully automated, automated that there is no way you can now interfere. That's it. Why? Because it's public. Uh, it's very logical. Um, and there is also the website is on the web, you know, the, its register is kept on the Minister of Finance website, but it's administered by the SFS. So, as actually, if SFS, State Fiscal Service, if they do something wrong, we will see it. They have no impact. So, actually, we, we just redesigned the person in such a way that it works. So a lot of this you can do this way. But when you're referring to the uh, uh, public administration, um, it's mainly means by changing people, bringing new people who could work um, uh, transparently, you know, this, uh, on different standards, right? And again, I refer to the example of the AT refund, right? We clean this area up. But those who remain in state fiscal service and still have some contacts with taxpayers on other issues, who would they take revenge, right? They actually will explode the, their opportunities with their powers how to squeeze as much as possible, right? So clearly those people, so a lot of things you can change with the processes, but still, when there is a contact, you cannot eliminate it, right? That's where you need to have, um, that's where an administrative reform is important. So, for example, when I look at state fiscal service, I understand that majority of the people have to go. They, 
they work for so many years without understanding that it should be a service organization. They should not take all taxpayers by definition, you know, by default uh, as guilty. You don't should come and say that, you know, but please, you know, I'm, I'm right. That's not correct. But this is the mentality of organization. So we've, um, we've, uh, we've launched the civil service reform two years ago. It's relatively successful. When I say relatively, because it brings some results, but it has very clear disadvantages. What disadvantages? And I was actually very um, outspoken about this back in 2015 when the law was adopted, is yes, you need to bring new people. Yes, the competitive selection you know, is, is important. But at the end of the day, you should not replace it also a personal responsibility. I, as a minister, I want to know who will work with me in the team. It's my responsibility to do these difficult reforms. And I cannot rely only on some competitive selections, you know, because at the end of the day, it's my responsibility. So in some areas, the administrative reform is successful. and some, I see that we made a mistake. Whether we'll be able to correct it, um, I think short term, no. Uh, but, um, but the administrative reform is a priority. For example, we as a government picked 10 ministries, and Minister of Finance is one of these, that will, as a pilot, um, rehire all the department's heads on the competitive uh, selection. And our aim is to bring as many new people to the ministries uh, as possible. Um, so we understand the importance of it. And the election year is not the obstacle. Um, but what I do know is this reform requires personal attention. Whatever touches, you know, whatever concerns people, you need to be personally involved. Because, you know, it's so easy to destroy the ministry. It's so easy to destroy the, you know, the, the culture within. Sometimes it's, it shouldn't be done. Sometimes you just need to add a bit more fresh people and more adventurism, right? And you will get the result of what you want to, uh, want to achieve. Thank you. Uh, is it quick? One more quick question. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I appreciate your optimism. I work here for the Institute of International Finance in Washington, and we provide our members with forecasts and analysis of uh, Ukraine economy. And we also highlight the challenges and risks. And one risk that is obvious there is the financing needs. The Ukraine still has a trade deficit, a current account deficit, and at the same time you had grace period on your external debt, and the grace period expires soon. And so the financing becomes pertinent. So my question would be how you see the development, how you see where the money will be coming from. Uh, do you have any plans on increasing borrowing or you believe, believe that you will be able to raise uh, direct investment sub sub sufficiently to finance your needs in 2019, 2020 maybe? Thank you. We adopted the midterm strategy for uh, uh, for debt management. Um, it's actually public. So pretty much it's, it lays out the, our, our plans. Yes, there are some significant payments coming in 2019 and 20. Um, as a part of the, um, you know, uh, it's a deal that we've done the debt issue in, uh, in September last year. Uh, we had some fresh money raised, but also some, we did some liability management. It allows us to, uh, to exchange the bonds that uh, would have re, uh, uh, to be uh, mature in uh, 19 and, uh, and 20. Um, and so we, we exchanged them, so we smooth out the, this uh, payment uh, profile. And uh, we plan to do it as well, right, uh, in the future. Um, the answer is we don't limit ourselves. We, we're exploring new instruments so that we as a ministry would have different instruments, whether it's you know, internal borrowing or if it's access of the uh, 
uh, foreign investors to the um, green denominated uh, bonds or whether it's just issuing the euro bonds. Question is obviously when is the most optimal conditions for that. Um, we expect uh, the majority of the borrowing being done after the level uh, after achieving the staff level agreement because that's what the market expects from us, right? Having said that, you know, if there will be some conditions, uh, good conditions now, we also could consider, you know, the uh, tapping the market for the uh, for, for a small amount. We as a ministry are very flexible, but we understand the what investors expect from us, we will deliver, right? So, yes, you, what you highlighted is uh, there will be some payments, but for everything there is an answer. For everything there is an answer. I don't see any, it, it's a challenge, but it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's very easy to, um, uh, to do it. Minister, thank you. You've been comprehensive and, no. and very candid uh, and uh, appreciate the overview of Ukraine's uh, successes and its remaining challenges and the reminder of the values that we share and the importance of a strong civil society, strong media and, and, a, and a strong democracy. So thank you for your time thank today. You. Thank you. Thank you.